sneaking up ever so close to the one-year anniversary of the creation of In Goal Radio, the podcast. I'm your host, Darren Millard. Today, we are going to chat with a current National Hockey League goaltender, a former National Hockey League goaltender, two different people, and also tell you about a product that could, one, help you rehabilitate from an injury that could stop you from practicing. Everybody hates that. Or just prevent an injury uh, before anything ever happens. It's a unique product. It's part of our gear segment. The Ingle Radio, the podcast presented by The Hockey Shop, source for Sports Surrey, thehockeyshop.com. Our great friends over there, including uh, Cam, uh, who's uh, back to work, I'm told, back on the podcast as uh, he joins our, our founder, our co-founder, Kevin Woodley along with David Hutchison, uh, who are on the podcast today. Uh, Dad, how are you doing over there? Hi. Everything good as you uh, as you round through the fall? Everything's fantastic. It's a fantastic time of year. I'm doing really well. And love that you mentioned the one-year anniversary is just around the corner. I can't believe it's been so long. It's amazing. And it's been far more consistent. Well, we published every week, mm-hmm. but it I, I honestly thought we'd have some downtime, but the the off season ended up being busier than than the season. At least at least for you and I. Woody still ran around like his he was head his head cut off. Pretty much all the time. Yeah. That's well, yeah, good point. That's kind of just me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's uh, we, we got have, mellow Woody uh, today. We have a couple of things that I want to get to uh, today, but first uh, let's let's get into our interviews and and right out of the gate, uh, presented by Source for Sports Surrey, the Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop dot com, uh, is a, a goaltender named Chris Mason, and he is a, a unique and very mm, easy person to pick out because of his. Mm, how would you how would you co- describe Chris Mason, Woody? Mm. He's big. He's got the goatee. He's intimidating. If you if you saw him in an alley, Some, he'd scare the bejesus out of you. Somebody you might see at an Iron Maiden con- concert or what? Yeah. 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 See, he's a, I don't see any of that. He's just made. Really? Oh, see, because just I think, a warm and cuddly friend of Woody's. And he's, and he's like the nicest guy ever, right? So it seems it. He is. He does yeah, like, seem it. So he like, I like. Yeah, there, I had momentary silence there when you, you were throwing that out there. I'm like, where is he going with this? I, I can see it, though. Well, I can see it. But he looks intimidating. And then, and then you have on the other side, uh, Pacarene, who we'll talk to in a little bit, who, who has the reputation of the, the nicest guy in, in the National Hockey League. So we're going to go from the uh, features of an intimidating person, who really isn't, in, in Chris Mason, and then the, the beautiful, wonderful person in Pecorene. Uh, two Nashville goaltenders, two guys with ties. One is a broadcaster for the Predators now in Mason, and the other is the uh, former Vezina Trophy winner and a future Hall of Famer in Pecorene. I'm putting him in there uh, right now. But uh, you had a chance to, uh, to catch up with, uh, with Chris Woody. Yeah, yeah. I had a chance to catch up with him at the rink uh, just prior to the Predators going on the ice at morning skate. We talked about doing it a little earlier, uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe over the phone, but it just made more sense to wait until he came and we could sit down and do it in person. Also had a chance to talk to Pekka while they were here. And you're right, like two of the nicest guys in the league um, to talk to and a couple of, you know, self-confessed goalie geeks, right? So when you get them going, wind them up on everything from gear to technique, it uh, they were both fun conversations. And with Mace, like that's like he is one of the, as, as he'll say, he's one of the original gear geeks pictures drew pictures of goalies when he was a kid in school uh worked with brian's on his custom gear the masks he had throughout his career with the iron maiden eddie like just like he's a goalie at heart through and through and it sounds like he takes a little heat for it at times from the rest of his nashville broadcast crew including hal gill so uh, we had some fun with it yeah they are they are two p's if you, you got to follow them on social because they are outstanding so good uh on on the uh, on the Instagram and Twitter, uh, Dad, we'll teach you about that in a little bit. Don't worry. <laughs> Actually, I, I make fun. Of, I make fun of Hutch. Yeah, uh, I wonder who was there first and social, and and he's way better at than than <laughs> than Woody and I combined. Um, what when I say Chris Mason to you, Hutch, what what is the first thing that pops out to you about his uh, National Hockey League career? Oh uh, well, you know what? This is going to be obscure and and mean nothing to anybody probably, but. Way back when In Goal started, uh, before I even knew Kevin, uh, and it's interesting that we're talking today about a small sort of startup product for goaltenders, uh, because way back when we started, there was a product called Blade Tape. I don't know if you remember that. It was a little sort of rubberized 
yes. strip you could put yes, down in, do. instead of regular hockey tape. And Mason was repping the company along with, I think Brian Burke was an advisor for them as well. And uh, so I did a little gear segment on blade tape back then. And the company set me up to, uh, to talk with Mace, uh, do a little pre podcast world interview with him that we were going to record and put on the show. Um, didn't work out that I was able to get in touch, although we tried to get in touch with each other. Um, but I was, you know, I was young, I was new at this. I was really nervous. And I remember I, the first thing that sticks out is I remember dialing Mason's phone one day and just the sheer nerves of speaking to an NHL goaltender for the first time in my life. Um, so it's it's a funny little take back what he didn't even know about when you were sitting there in the stands, but but there's no an idea. interesting tie in both to to small products for goaltenders today and to Chris Mason. A lot of fun for me. Told you he was intimidating, Woody. You don't get it, but he's even even when you can't see Mason, he's intimidating. Well, anybody uh, would have been at that point. A couple of uh, things that jump out of the interview. One, which really I connected with and had never thought of in a long time, is being able to look at a goaltender. And know exactly when he makes a save who that is. Uh, even from the high wide non HD world, you could you could tell. Okay, that was that was Kirk McLean. That was Jill Malash. That was go go down. I'm trying to connect different generations, and it's much harder now uh, to do that. The the Rangers, I legitimately have to see a close up to tell whether it's Lundqvist or Georgia right now. And you guys are in a different plane than I am, but. Uh, being able to tell, but those those are two in particular that I have trouble uh, during the game uh, telling apart uh, these days. So so the the era that that Mason came up, would he slam me on this? And Lundqvist is one of the more unique and individual guys. Still, like there are still elements of his game that stand out as being different from the rest. I, I think it's even more homogenized probably between some other examples. The good mm-hmm. news the good news for Mace is the styles may be starting to bleed in together, but he has no problem telling Pecorine and uh, UC Saros apart. It's kind of like <laughs> a big brother, yeah. big brother, little brother. Exactly. One barely gets to the crossbar and the other towers over it. But I, I, it was interesting, interesting to hear that because, uh, you know, I kind of agree. It, you know what would be interesting? What would be fascinating? If we were to run clips of similar crease movement patterns and save executions, if you were able to delete the logo and just make like somehow NHL Silhouette highlights them or something, but with silhouettes and, and ask mm-hmm. people to identify what goaltender it was, I think that would be. And it's kind of funny because this comes what a week after we talked about Jake Allen going out and imitating some of right. the uniqueness of two caress movements. But you're right. Most guys of a younger generation, they are starting to bleed in together. I'll, I'll save my well. Here's the uh, here's the other one that jumped out at me. I've never heard somebody use the term spatial intelligence before. And listen for it in, in the conversation. Chris Mason drops spatial intelligence. I almost drove off the road. Uh, and and I did park and then sent a text to myself so I would remember that one. I like it. It was uh, it's 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 cool. Hey, uh, on the subject of uh, of movements, I've been thinking about this. If you took 10 NHL players at random skaters and asked them the numbers of uh, Henrik Lundqvist, Carey Price, uh, Jimmy Howard, Sergei Bobrovsky, and let's go with uh, Jonathan Quick. You mean like the, like the numbers on their jersey? Yes. How many, how many out of five do you think the average 10 skaters would get or fans? Do. Fans don't know number uh, numbers of goaltenders I or get, players. I gotta be yet honest, they're more you, distinct now than ever. Yeah, like Bob seventy two. Like it's so unique, right? But I, I be honest with you. Like I mean, I I know carries because I turned. Carries I just, is pretty I, easy I, to I, get. I, I look behind. Yeah, I, I look like behind you, me on the wall, but. Uh, you know, Lundqvist too, Not actually has his framed sweater up there. Yeah, Lundqvist too. But honestly, like I, I'm not a Jersey guy. And and somebody asked me the other day, why does Jacob Markstrom wear 25? And I've never asked him. It's a unique goalie number. Mm-hmm. And I've never asked him. Um, so, and yeah, 19. I, yeah, guilty myself. Guilty myself there. And I'm not sure. I, I, okay. I, I doubt a lot of NHL players could. Because here we are geeking on the minutia of goaltending. I don't think I could name half of them. Yeah, like eight, we know Dowdy. Uh, uh, there's some guy named uh, Crosby. I mean, go down the list. But even even we know we know our favorite teams' numbers. Uh, but we we rarely look at the uh, at the goaltender. Well, and goaltenders are crazy. Always used to be one thirty or thirty five, right? Like that was right. kind of the standards. Roberto Luongo, why do you wear number one? Because number one says it all, right? Like 
like there was some uniqueness to that answer, despite it being a sort of common goalie number. Nowadays, it's you know, I mean, what you got? Tw- if a guy wears twenty, chances are it was it's for Trechiak or some tie to that for the longest no, time. Um, it's but beyond that, you're right. Like it's, this, to be honest with you, this screams story, and you just gave me a story idea. So thanks, Darren. Save, yes. save me a column for one of my weeks. NHL.com coming up it. soon. I love it. Contributor to Kevin Woodley's fine art of literature. I am literally uh, we'll, making a note. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get it while you do that. Uh, well, let's roll your conversation with Chris Mason, a former National Hockey League goaltender. I love his time with Team Canada. He is uh, ahead of the curve as far as uh, repping his personality on his full equipment, not just the mask. And now he's a broadcaster applying his trade with the Nashville Predators. One of the first guys I ever saw wear a headset during the game while backing up and do one of those in-game interviews. So uh, this, this natural progression to broadcasting was very easy for him. Uh, it's Chris Mason, player broadcaster and goalie geek on in goal radio presented by source for sports surrey the hockey shop the hockey shop.com joining kevin woodley so this is um this is actually a first we have done this podcast we've done these feature interviews in my car we had roberto luongo the first one in my car oh, really? <laughs> yeah we've had a couple guys in the car but this is the first time so people are going to hear some background noise we're actually watching this the canucks are winding up a morning skate the predators will be out here pretty soon um and of course that brings us to our guest today chris mason of course played for the predators for a long time now doing uh some analysis work uh with the preds mace thanks for joining us on the in goal radio podcast thanks for having me buddy this is gonna be fun we got uh we're doing a first here yeah so we're, we're, we're breaking gritty. we're breaking new ground we're getting trenches. dirty we had to get away from the media room because you were getting chirped hard <laughs> by hal gill and multiple the rest sources of oh yeah about talking goaltending all the time so let me ask you there, like the, the current gig, as much as I geek out on goaltending and I know you have some passion for the position, how do you, how do you have to walk that line between not getting too geeky with the, with the average folk? I mean, let's face it. Defensemen aren't usually the brightest lot. Um, <laughs> that's what goalies always tell me, but say, so do you have to dumb it down or what? Well, you know what? I tried to, uh, I was fortunate enough to go to a couple broadcast meetings before I actually got into the full-time position. So I just really took to heart what they said about uh, just knowing your audience and not, you know, acting like I'm talking to uh, a 10 year NHL veteran or someone that's in the position. Cause I think a lot of times when people start anyway, you think you have to show, you know, how smart you are, or, you know, a lot of people, I can see people doing that, trying to justify what they're saying, saying, you know, trying to prove that, you know, what you're talking about. So, uh, I just really tried to really talk in basic terms. And I used a lot, it helped me to actually coach younger kids because, uh, you know, going from playing to coaching. It's one thing to be able to play, you know, anybody could have told me as a player, hey, do this, 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 I could process it and do that. But to communicate it on a level where you're teaching someone to understand what you're talking about and and demonstrate. So that that actually really helped me in the broadcast because I was able to verbalize and break things down a little, uh, a little easier instead of trying to go into this realm of Middle Earth that, you know, goaltending that nobody would really understand. So um, no, but it is sometimes, especially when I started, because it was easy for me as soon as Pekka or, or Juicy, UC Saros made a save, I could easily go into great detail about what just happened on that play. But I try to make sure that, you know, when it's time to talk about that, I do, but also, you know, do the other layers of the play that are also involved by the other players. But at first it was tough because I would just gravitate toward goaltending. As I think most smart people, I mean, goaltending is the best part of the game, let's be honest. And the good news is the audience you got today is all geek. So yeah. <laughs> we, we can, get, we can oh. get as technical as we want. Yeah. But what I first want to ask is, we usually start this with a lot of guys, is where did it start for you? Like, where did the passion for the position, how was that fostered for you, you know, as a young guy growing up in, in Red Deer, right? Yeah, it was, it was Red Deer. And, and just growing up, I, I just, like, I'm sure every goalie that's listening right now, or you yourself, I, I was just, I loved hockey. I love street hockey, but I was just enamored by the gear, the equipment, the 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 pressure of the situation that you're you're the guy, it's all on your shoulders. You can win the game or, you know, you, you just, I think that goalies just, you know, you, you want to be that person um, that when the game's on the line that, you, you know, you're, you're comfortable in that position. A lot of people aren't, you know, they don't want to be the pitcher. They don't want to be the goalie. They want to be the quarterback, but, but the equipment, when I was a young kid, I just, I drew goalies. I had all the hockey cards, the sticker books, 
I would draw every goalie in the league. Um, you know, I just loved, especially when, when I was, when we were growing up, every, every single goalie had such a unique style. So you would know just by watching that you, you wouldn't even have to know you, you just see them make one move and you know who that goalie was. And now I, I think a lot of goalies, there's such a, which is, I mean, it, it's incredible, you know, how talented these guys are, but uh, there's, there's just more education and training and lessons. So they're all very similar in the technique, you know, the technical side of the game, which is uh, made the position a lot better. But I just remember back in the day, it was just so cool to see how different a guy would make a save. Did you have a guy like who was your guy? Was there a guy growing up where it was like, man, I want to be like him? At what point in that evolution of loving the gear and wanting to just be out there all the time and in the pressure, did it go from that to maybe even emulating some of the guys you were watching on TV? Yeah, it, a lot of guys. I, I, you know, I would, uh, I didn't become a full time goaltender until I was 11. I, uh, you know, I played out and back then you got to take turns being goalie and I would, want to be goalie a little more. So I got a couple extra times in the rotation. And then when I was 11 years old, I finally went to uh, a goalie school and it was for my favorite goalie, Andy Moog up in Penticton. Hi, Andy was a guest just a couple weeks was ago really? on the podcast. And it's it, funny because all the knowledge that he has from playing, like he's still coaching Portland Winterhawks. Um, just how much of it translates to today's game, whether it's technical or patience. It, it was a fascinating discussion. Yeah, he, he, he's awesome. I mean, it, you know, the, the technical side obviously has really changed, but some of the biggest principles too, you know, about uh, just having your eyes on pucks and, and just reading plays and, and just all these different things, the anticipation factor. And um, I think a lot of times, you know, when I was playing, I would skate in the summers with younger kids and you would do drills and these young kids are just lights out and the skill level was off the charts, you know, but then you get into live practice uh, and it's not as, it's not as predictable. There's more reactionary, uh, things that are involved, got either staying on your feet a little longer or, you know, watching pucks off your body for the second shot, scramble ability, those types of things. I felt, you know, the younger generation, in my opinion, anyway, maybe it's getting it's getting better now. I know that because there's so many you guys and all the goaltending coaches are aware of that. But um, that was one of the biggest things I noted when, noticed when it was kind of transitioning into the, you know, the new era of goaltending. But um, but as for Annie Moog, so he he was my guy. I just I, I just loved watching him play and I got to go to his hockey school and he was awesome uh to me I had a I had a video of my parents recorded on the camcorder of him you know taking a we're doing a little picture and he, he did the old bunny ears behind uh you know behind my head and we ended up getting a race which I'm it sucked but uh but that was kind of he was he was my guy but I I loved every every goalie and but Andy Moog was the one I, I just loved how he played gear now it's funny you talk about goalies maybe becoming a little sort of everybody starts to look a little bit like each other. We've seen a little bit of that trend with the gear. You were a guy, uh, Brian's gear started in Eagle, but Brian's gear later in the career logos on the pad, like, like sharp graphics stood out. What do you see in today's game? Cause we have the ability now between Brian's and their incredible, you know, so and cut graphics to now, Bauer, frankly, can put with their digital print and their true design, anything on a pad. We've seen some beauties, but we've also seen a trend towards all white. Where does the kid who grew up drawing the equipment in school, you know, doodling gear equipment, like what, what does he feel the game's at now in terms of style? Uh, I think I think it's great. I love uh, yeah, the, the, the Bauer that that's pretty cool. Um, I love the Brian's cut. And so, I mean, that's like just to me, that's traditional, authentic, but it's it's got that creative factor and it just looks clean with the same material. Um, but I, I love it now. I, I love that, you know, I, I played in the era where it, it's when I first started, it was, you know, the colors weren't a big deal. You just chose any colors you want. If you wanted to go dark, that was cool. And then it kind of phased into everybody's well, you know, optically white makes you look bigger. It's more deceiving to the shooter and all this, whether that's true or not. I, I, I really, I don't buy into that. I don't know if that's a thing. You probably have more insight on that than I do, but, um, but I love guys going back to dark, like, you know, Smitty in, in Edmonton. His, his he setup, doesn't look small. He doesn't look small. <laughs> and he's got like, a sick setup. But the guys, a lot of the guys, Pekka went uh, Navy last year at the end of the season for the first time in his career. And I thought it just looked awesome. So I, I, I like the UC range. goes all gold, like goes like with the yellow gold. I, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, has Mace got something to do with this? Yeah, no. I, and that surprised me, too, because he's a very conservative kid. He's, you know, uh, he's soft spoken. And that was uh, that was awesome. I think he's the first one. In Preds history to, to do the all gold, which is cool. And they, they love that in Nashville. Um, but they both kind of went off the, off the board there with the Navy and gold at the same time. 
they're back to their, you know, their more traditional style now. But although UC teased me, he says he's got in the retroflex. He's got the Retroflex graphic now. He told he teased me. He's got a he's got some gold coming. Ooh, okay, okay. I'm looking forward to seeing the Winter Classic setups. Maybe that's what it, what it's for. He didn't give me specifics, but oh, okay, okay. Some I, color yeah. coming. I don't what know. I'm that's told. good. That's good. We we played well on him too. So you know, as a goalie, if you if you wear something, you play well. That's uh, you're probably going back to that at some I, point. I, and I think that's you know you said there are some studies that White looks bigger, and you know Ian Clark here in Vancouver doesn't let his goalies have dark around the on the outer edge because he wants that visual ambiguity for a shooter, even if it's for a split second. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, you, you didn't think it looked bigger. So it, it's all about to me, what the goalie feels in his own mind. Like, and that, you know, goes back to confidence, right? If you feel big and you feel confident in your stuff, I don't know that it makes that much of a difference in real life to the other guys. Yeah. And you know, it caught, I mean, every goalie, I'm sure you talk to confidence is the number one. Everyone's got, you know, if you're at this level, You've got, you know, relative skill levels. And the, the, the thing that separates the elite guys from the, from the good guys in this league is their ability to, you know, to put a tough game behind them and come out and play, you know, a strong game. The next game, they cut off those, you know, three, four bad games in a row. Um, the elite guys have such an ability just to, to kind of put, you know, those tough outings behind them and get back to, you know, that, their upper level. I mean, obviously, if they're at their peak, they can stay at their peak level a lot longer than, you know, the, the average guy. But any any guy in this league, I mean, if you go head-to-head on any given night, you know, you put your best against each other, it's a coin toss, I think. So especially now, the, the gap between, you know, the top goalie in the league to the worst goalie, it's obviously big, but it, it's getting smaller and smaller. So, so let me ask you, where did, I mean, throughout their career, I mean, Nashville, St. Louis, Atlanta, Winnipeg, um, a little time overseas, Throughout that evolution of your game, because I'm guessing like like all goalies that last as long as you did, you had to change as the game changed in front of you. Was there an anchor for you that provided that confidence? Where, where did you generate that confidence? Was it practice? Was it in setup and feeling like if I'm in this stance or if I, I feel comfortable? Where, where did you generate confidence and how do you teach it to kids? How do you help them find it? Well, to me, it's, it's, it's all about sometimes less is more and just and, and proper positioning i think an understanding of situations and how much time you actually have i, th- I feel like when you know if a goalie is going through a slump and, and it's such a unique position because almost any other position in sports you you can determine you know what happens by what you do but as a goalie you have to wait until the situation happens to you so but- yeah you have no ability it's the only you can compare it to quarterbacks and pitchers but they get to dictate an element of the play goalies exactly. have no control over what happens. You have no control over. And I, th- I find when, you know, a goalie's going through a tough time or they want to come out and you, you, you you want to try so hard. You almost, you want to go after a little more. So you're a little more aggressive. And I find that's counterproductive as a goaltender, but I, I feel the understanding of, you know, even a play like, you know, you know, if, if, if you're coming, guys coming down a wing and, you know, shoots far side, low far side, and you give up a big rebound, and it goes right on a guy's stick the, to understand how much time that you actually have, what route that you should take. You know, if you go back to your post instead of, you know, scrambling across, doing a full desperation split. If, but if you keep your eyes on that puck, you could almost be in the exact same position, out of position and make that save just because you see that puck coming with, a, you know, with even a small minor push. And I worked on that. That's what helped me as I went on. I worked a lot with that, with uh, Rick Wamsley, actually, in, um, in St. Louis. We worked on that stuff. but. Mitch Korn was one of my biggest influences, and it was always about the eyes, always having that eyes on the puck. That's going to buy you, you know, th- those valuable split seconds to make that save when you're completely out of position or you're in a scramble mode to maybe, you know, be in a situation where you don't have to scramble and you can stay in your structure. But if you watch that puck, but I think a lot of people just automatically make a save and then, you know, dive across. But um, practice for me was the generator, I think, and just just reps and 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 seeing the puck and doing drills that allowed you to to follow and keep your eyes on that puck and just kind of really that was that was that was my thing if i could see it i felt good and when you're struggling it's funny how you know the uh the vision sort of shrinks in around you and you and you don't have that the awareness and, and you try too hard and i was a hard worker that was one of the things that was kind of my mo was my work ethic and um you have to learn to control that and i had to control learn to control that and kind of scale it back and just be smart about it it's funny I, I think the one thing i hear is like probably similar to what you're saying like like eyes first versus body first as soon as you start chasing with the body first usually it's at the expense of being able to see it like you're you know you start chasing it physically 
rather than finding it first. And you, you tend to actually start moving out of the way because you're, you're not moving in a, in a good biomechanical pattern. Yeah, exactly. Good biomechanical or you're, or you're taking the wrong route. You're guessing. You're guessing where to go. The puck went over there and you're just guessing, well, maybe I should jump straight across or slide straight across or whatever. But I think when you see it, it just it just slows everything down. And then you just it just helps with your reads. And you're not, you know, sometimes I know the bang, bang plays. You got to something you just got hey, you got to scramble and do whatever you have to do to get a piece of your body in front of that shot. But um, that's what I like about the guys now is is that they have a good understanding, the spatial intelligence of of where to go in certain situations. I think the reverse VH uh, is that what you guys still call it? Reverse, reverse. reverse yeah. yeah, the reverse. I think that's. Uh, that's helped a, like on a ton of those, you know, spots and being more efficient for guys doing wrap rounds. It's, it's that's tough to beat a guy in a wrap, or if you, even if you're passing from you know behind the goal line, far side back door, the guy's got half a push in his, you know, center mass is right on the angle. It's incredible. And yet we, and yet all we hear from a lot of people is stand up, damn it, every wow. time the reverse fails, and it does. And there's an element of read to when to be in it and all those things. But it, I think Luongo put it best on our one of our first podcasts was. Everybody sees the one it doesn't help me with, but they don't see the 10 that I make an easy save that wouldn't have been easy if I didn't use it. Exactly. And that's one of those things. I mean, it's no matter what you do, I, I just think you're more vulnerable. If, if you stay on your feet at those angles, you're going to be letting a lot more in. And maybe, you know, you get away from letting that one that these guys hit where there's a, a two inch window right over your shoulder. And it's, it's, it's a, you got to sometimes as hard as it is, sometimes you got to tip your cap. These guys are elite freaking world-class players and for them to hit that spot sometimes it, that's the only place they had you got to say you know what that's a hell of a shot and usually at this level it's uh with no time and space and no like you said no backswing the releases are so deceptive so i wanted to ask you about that because you you have been in the net yeah uh, even now that you've transitioned to the broadcast even just a couple days ago you were in the net for practice i brought up that same old brian's gear with the national predators logo yeah, yeah, on it yeah. it's just beauties yeah and you were a guy that Mitch, I remember telling me when you were playing, he believed that your ability to read releases and, and read blades and read sticks um, was, was one of your separators. Everybody has different things that separate them from everyone else. So my question to you, how much tougher are those releases now going back in practice? And how'd you do it? Like, how did you build the ability to read releases? How much of it was experience in book and how much of it was hands and blade? Like, what did you watch? To me, it was, yeah, that's, that's a good qu question, but I, I just, I feel it, the combination of everything, body position, uh, hands, and then blade. And, you know, I guess, if, if, you know, if, over time you start to develop patterns and then if you see the same guy, cause every, everyone does it different, uh, differently. And the guys that, that can do less of that and give you less information are, are the hardest to stop. Like, I, you know, Pavel Datsuk is one of the hardest guys. I've ever went against the hardest guy that I've ever faced because he didn't give you that information. He did something different every time. So as a player, you know, if, it, if it, there's any young kids out there listening, that's, you know, try to hide it. Try to you don't give any information. Philip Forsberg is another guy I get to see a lot. I saw him as a rookie come in, um, just doesn't give a lot of information. And it just really catches goalies off guard. It's tough to control it. Or if you're getting a piece of it, you don't know where that rebound's going. But um, a lot of it's the body information, the stick. You know, I remember, you probably remember this too, when they said, look at the player's eyes. Yeah, like, you never look at the eyes. Like, you, you watch the puck. And remember then you, Ovechkin yeah, had yeah. the, like, mirrored visor and they yeah. made it illegal because... <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Like, I mean, I, you know, you, you don't do that. But what was the first part of your question? I got rambling there, sorry. Oh, no, we were just, we were talking about releases and the first part was kind of like what, like, being in practice oh, nowadays oh, yeah, and yeah, seeing yeah. them now compared to when you played, how has it changed? And probably deception, as you said, Forsberg, deception is on, off the charts. Oh, now. it's off the charts. And, you know, for me, when I went back to practice, I, I could, I, I feel I could still read it, but I, my body just, my brain, my body does not react to what my brain's telling me as fast as it used to. So that's like, that's a little, uh, I'm a little bit behind, but no, oh, man, the, the way that these guys, the accuracy that they can shoot at, we were talking about this before, it is just, you give them a little inch or a couple inches or anything, they're going to hit their spot. And everyone in the NHL, like everyone can shoot now. There's no, there's no more like, like everyone hits it like a hundred miles an hour, quote unquote, like the skill, first line to fourth line. Yeah. And in games, I don't think, you know, fans don't realize because guys have to play a certain role and they're not, they don't get to, you know, express themselves uh, offensively because they have a certain defensive job to do or they're shut down. But you get these guys in practice. And I think a lot of people would be surprised 
at the level of skill of, you know, the, even the third or fourth liners. And I don't want to minimize their roles, but in a game, they have a certain job to do. But believe me, they can still shoot and they can still dangle and they're good on breakaways and all these types of things. So it was, it was really cool. I love to get uh, out there every once in a while. Now, uh, you started the career. So first, I guess, six seasons with the National Predators. was meant a lot of Mitch Korn. We were, we were talking, I was talking with Pekka yesterday about sort of his evolution as a young goalie under Mitch. And um, I think the word I used was blunt. Mitch doesn't pull any punches with you as a goaltender. What was that experience like working with him? What were some of your takeaways that maybe you still, you know, use as a coach yourself working with young kids? Well, I think, you know, blunt is a great way. He had a lot of, you know, cliches. But he was such a he was such an effective communicator. The way that he was able to break down verbally and, and help you, you know, demonstrate what he wanted you to do or what changes you needed to make. Or if you're doing a video session, you, you just you have I just had complete understanding when Mitch Korn was was breaking something down. And he was my first real goalie coach that I'd, I'd, I really spent a lot of time with. So you so all the way like you didn't get your first. And I guess that, I mean, that's not that uncommon. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. We didn't have most NHL teams didn't have a second guy. No. So you come up with Prince George in the WHL. And you don't get your first real genuine goalie coach till you hit the NHL with Mitch. Yeah. And we had, uh, I was with Anaheim. I played in Cincinnati my first year, and Francois Allaire was the goalie coach in Anaheim. But he would only, he only came down, I think, one time during my first season. And um, it was, that was interesting too, because he was obviously, that's when the whole butterfly blocking style of goaltending, um, he really was effective with that came out. And he tried to, you know, teach us some of the elements of that. And I was with Tom Askey. I don't know if you remember that name. And both of us were pretty, non-structured, you know, just kind of stop the puck, however you stop the puck growing up to that was a really tough thing to, you know, resist the urge to use your hands, bring it in, play the percentages on the angles. But that, you know, it was, it was kind of funny because as soon as he would leave, our coach would say, Hey, don't, you know, don't listen to what he's saying. Just stop the puck. You know, he'd say, <laughs> he'd say a little, something else in there too. But, um, so it was kind of, it was, you know, that was old school mentality, but with Mitch, man, I, I spent a lot of years with Mitch and, I'm I'm really forever grateful for the time that we had together because he really put in the time and effort with me and he does it with all his goalies and uh, just the understanding of the position that I, I, I gained from working with him because, you know, I mean, you're a goalie and a lot of it was instinctual, but the way that he would break things down and just connect everything and the anticipation, he just took my knowledge of the position to the next level where I started thinking as a, a student outside the, you know, just being in the net and just understanding plays and, you know, having more information and how that's going to help you with guys, you know, you develop tendencies in guys anyway, but just the understanding of every other aspect of the position uh, of hockey to help you, you know, be more successful. And he, uh, he did a lot for me. Now, St. Louis for a couple of years, you mentioned Whammer and then Atlanta for a year in Winnipeg. So first Jets team, which brought us back to some cool gear. And I, I forgot to mention, Eye candy air with the sick Iron Maiden oh, mask. Yeah. Like, we're going to have to put some of those. I have to dig those out of the archives and put them on social media. Music guy, when did you start putting Iron Maiden on the mask and the Iron Maiden Eddie? And what was the story behind that? Because those are some of the sweeter lids, I think. You know, yeah. those, those, one of those needs to be. We had Hershey on and his psycho mask is in oh, the Hall that's, of Fame. I love that mask. We need one of those. We need one of those Eddie masks in the hall. Yeah. Well, it was, it was the first year or two, and it, it was. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I like, I actually just went to Iron Maiden in Nashville this summer, but I, I am an Iron Maiden fan. I'm not like, I'm not a diehard. People, I think, think that because I had it on the mask, but I, I love the artist, uh, Derek Riggs and, you know, Steve at Eye Candy Air uh, and staff. They're, they're, they're the best. I, I miss, I miss working with those guys. They're just the, the best. And, and I remember they actually went and got permission rather than yep. just steal the artwork. Yep. I think a lot of NHL masks, like, you know, they're, imitations of pop culture yeah. that just get taken. I, I gave them credit. They went and made sure they had permission oh, yeah. from the artist that, that, that created that yep. to put it on your mask, which is kind of cool. It's to me. really cool. They, they, yeah, they got permission and they, I, they actually, I, I got a book sent for me uh, by Derek Riggs, the, the artist of Eddie. And uh, so that's pretty cool. And it's got a bunch of his artwork, Iron Maid and everything else. So that was cool. But yeah, I was, I really liked the artist. I wanted something with uh like a skull kind of guy on it. And, and, uh, and Steve thought that, you know, that Eddie of him in that plane, that fighter jet would be perfect. So I'm like, yes, we're doing this. And it, uh, it was great. That's, that's one of my favorite lids ever. So Atlanta, Winnipeg, and then back to Nashville. Yeah. Second time around. What was that? I mean, and, and I'm looking, I'm trying to do the math in my head. Was Mitch still there in 20? 20... Yeah. Mitch was still there. Um, 
that was uh, more of a, I, I couldn't, it was a weird situation. I could have went back to Winnipeg, but they waited till like, it was, it was just a weird situation. Uh, I remember they picked up Gustafson in Toronto and I think they're having a, an issue with um, Pavlik and his contract. He was threatening to go back to the KHL and I was just a weird. And I thought, you know what? I'm the year before Nashville had a great year. I wasn't getting any younger. So I knew my time in the NHL was probably coming to an end pretty soon. And unfortunately it didn't work out very well going back there because we got half our team ended up being hurt and we were, we were terrible and it was just um, not a great year. But at the year before, they went to uh, the, the good playoff run. They had a good group of veterans. And uh, so I thought this would maybe be my best chance to have a chance to win and, you know, do that type of thing, be in a situation where I love. Uh, but yeah, but that was about it. I went over to play uh, Europe a couple years after that and now back doing, uh, back doing the broadcast. Now, hold on. You said win, win a championship, but you went. During the 0405, you you have a title. May not have been a cup, but you have a title. It, Norway, 0405 lockout. Chris Mason. Yeah, yeah, we went over there. It was it was, was awesome. Like? It was awesome. It was uh, the the year before is my first year in the NHL, and the lockout came, and I was like, oh my god, this is I can't believe it. I finally you know get a chance and make it in the NHL, and they have a lockout, and then a lot of teams in Europe wouldn't sign you unless you signed a, a whole year agreement, you know, unless you're a star. And obviously I was just getting in and uh, I went over there. Scott Hartnell was over there and he said, Hey, do you want to come play and, you know, get some games? And I'm like, yeah, I gotta, I have to play. I'm like, if, you know, if this lockout ends, I gotta be ready to go. So I went over there. They ended up canceling the season. We won a championship and it was, it was awesome. It was so much fun. And we ended up, I won another one in, in Italy, my first year out of the NHL. And that was with Amazing. Ri written? Am I saying written. that? Yeah, written? written. And that was the first one, their village. It was a little village up in this mountain, uh, like 10,000 people, all the villages. And it, it was, we had the best celebration ever after that because it was the first championship they'd won in, uh, you know, the first top division there. But it was, uh, th those are, you know what? It doesn't matter when you, what league you win in. Obviously, I would have loved, loved, loved to win a Stanley Cup. That's every player's ultimate dream. But, uh, you know, winning with a group of guys, no matter what league, was just something you never forget. You kind of tied together for eternity with those those memories. You also have some medals with the Maple Leaf on your chest. And I know the gold medal in 2007, you were the third guy. So didn't, yep. But 2009, 4-0 with a, with a 1.0 goals against average silver medal. Forget Like you have some international experience and had some success over there. What were those? Exp was it like going to the uh, big ice? What was, you, and then the other one was, you're listed as a as a standby for 2010. Yeah, I. So how yeah. did that pan out? Were you actually here? No. Okay, no. so you were. I, I was. I was not. But I had to. Uh, I had to let them know exactly where I was going to be at all, like hotel and all this kind of stuff in case something happened. Where during they, the 2010 winter during the Olympic. 2010, so I had to fill out this big, uh, you know, three sheet questionnaire and all these types of things in case you know you got your name got added, then you have to be available to drug test and all these types of different things. So. That was really cool. And um, I, I came off a, a really good year the year before with St. Louis. And, um, you know, that kind of put me on the map, I think, for that. And, you know, for, for me, though, to I'll never forget more, almost more than playing in the NHL. When I got to I got asked to play for Team Canada, it, it was the ultimate dream come true. Like this is this I used to do all the time when I was a kid and I, I'd go to the outdoor rinks and I'd be by myself, but I'd be like behind the net. For Team Canada playing against Russia and all these, you know, all these types of things, all these different scenarios, and um, it was it was almost like an out of body experience to to go and put that maple leaf on your on you know and see that your name on the back uh, of a Team Canada jersey. It was one of the biggest do you honors. Have the do you have the I have all my. Do you have a collection of masks and jerseys from your playing career? I, I do. I don't have all of my masks. I, I don't have all my jerseys. I have all my Team Canada ones. I, I don't have them displayed in my house. I have some of my masks up just on the shelf up in the, uh, in the upstairs room. But I, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe when I get older, I just feel a bit. Still too close to it? Well, just too. I don't know. Like, I, know, I got, I, I got dude, a family. I'd have, I'd have that in the front hallway, man. Yeah. I got, it would be like the first thing people yeah, see when yeah. they come into my house. But, you know, you got a family of five and then I, you know, I don't want my stuff plastered all over the place. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe. It'll be nice keepsakes for my kids one day. And I think maybe, you know, get a couple special ones up there. I don't know. I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the fence with that stuff. Last but. one, because I've kept you too long. So we watched the Predators go through their morning routine. Um, I'm a big fan of UC Staros. 
and just the quietness of his game and the way he doesn't, the way he doesn't, the patience. And I mean, he doesn't, for lack of a better term, like he just doesn't move out of the way. And a lot of goalies do. But this guy at the other end in front of us, Pekka, I know you're biased. I'm not. I cover it. Like this may be the best person I've ever had the pleasure of talking to in the NA. Like he is just up there as a person, as in a, what, what's it like to get to watch him go to work every day? The passion and oh, man. constantly evolving still today, trying to make, you know, changes all the time. Well, you know, I'll start with, with Saros. The first time I saw him, he was probably the, honestly, technically the best goalie. I, he, he blew me out of, you know, your, your goalie five eleven, five ten, or whatever he is. And what the first knock is how small he's going to be. But, um, no, he, he's just technically incredible. And I think he's really helped, uh, you know, Pekka evolve his game. When you have a guy that's like that, who's almost just automatic every time he's, you know, doing these saves and he still keeps his eyes and his hands engaged. He's just so good. And I really think they've really helped each other evolve as goalies and keep Pekka. Like he, you know, well, I, you, you know, I the remember, transformation. I remember, yeah. I remember Pekka telling me like, I got this, like this, this guy yeah. is 5'10 and he's less aggressive than I am at 6'5. Like, there's a lesson here. Like he, he's clearly taken elements. He's taken elements and that's why he's still playing at the level he's playing. But you know, to your point about Pekka and his character and how he is the nicest person ever. He's one of the, the best guys. He's one of the most competitive guys. He's, he's a great teammate. One of the most respected guys in this game. Um, I honestly can't say enough things about him, but if anybody ever takes time to watch an interview or listen to him, he gives very well thought out, thoughtful answers. He, he's, he's, more than happy to give it his time and um it's it's genuine uh, you know a lot of times people put on a front for the media and you're you know you're a nice guy in front of the camera and not so much behind the camera it's exactly what you see um with peck and you know you've dealt with him a lot he's just he's just one of the best and i just i hope you know there's a lot of good guys in this game yeah, like course, so i mean and i've, I've yeah. been fortunate enough to build relationships with a lot yeah. of them but man he just there's just a salt of the earth the gen like you said genuine is the word sincere thoughtful yep. insightful yeah every time i get a chance to talk i don't know if it's good for him poor guy every time he comes to vancouver he has to deal with me <laughs> but um man it's uh it's just an absolute pleasure and then last one that evolution you talked about the sort of quieting and you know a little less reachy and yet at the same time the other evolution for me was when they became a low event team a team that didn't give a, t a ton of shots and he felt like he needed a rhythm Dude, does anybody get out of the net and handle more pucks than him? And that was an, that was a conscious attempt to stay in games behind a team that didn't give him as many shots. Like it was part of his way of engaging. Well, that that's a great point because when when they kind of did do tra like they, there's an evolution in the Predators too, and they did go to that style. It, that's hard for a goalie. You're you're on a team where you're getting 35 every night, and you're you know you get in that rhythm, and it's easy to get going. And then you go to a team. A lot of goalies struggle with that. When it goes down, all of a sudden you're getting 23 25 shots and they're spread out more people so always like like people outside the position just always assume less shots are easier and yeah. i don't know how many times that like it's just not it's like, not it, there are guys that cannot they're guys that i had argued curtis joseph should be in the hall of fame but put him behind the detroit red wings who didn't give up a lot of chances yeah and he was struggled wasn't the same guy he struggled well it, it's it's you're watching your team play on the other end for five minutes and all of a sudden you give up a two-on-one and you got to make that save and, and, and if that's what you're thinking about, yeah, you're yeah. probably in trouble. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's just, it, it is something that you have. And he, like you said, he, he found a way to stay engaged, uh, to keep his brain on and just mentally and, and physically warm in the game and stuff like that. And he, he did a great job of doing that. He's just, again, that's what separates those guys is just their mental strength and their ability to adapt. And, um, you know, I think at this age, if you see any of the goaltenders, Jonathan Quick's having a little bit of time, they're kind of the older guys. Mike Smith has his moments, but he's still coming around, I think, in terms of getting all the way uh, modern, I guess. I don't know if that's the right, you know, Luongo, he was still playing OK, but I, I don't think he completely transformed. But I, I think I think Peck is and I'm not taking away anything. These these guys are some of the best some you know, Hall of Famers. In tall, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I and I love watching. Them. I think they're amazing goaltenders. Um, but I, I just, I, and it's hard to do. I tried to do that too. I spent summers trying to change my technique and modernize it. But I, I, but I think Peck has completely done it. And a credit, and a credit to Benny too. Because well, Benny's, you know, it's interesting. I, I do the same thing with the Islanders when we talk about them. We talk about Mitch and we, and, and we forget about Piero Greco, who's there working with him. I think Benny, that's a tough spot to come in behind a goalie coach who I would argue should be in the Hall of Fame at some point soon. Oh yeah. Um, to be the guy that follows that and to still continue the evolution and make those goalies that Mitch had worked with for so long better. I think 
Benny Vanderklok gets sometimes, maybe not in your market, but around the league, people forget. And he's done a remarkable job with these two. He's done an ama- he's done an amazing job. Well, he you know he's had Saros the whole time, and yeah, um, he's had Pekka for many many years now, and he helped really helped that evolution. So he he deserves a ton of credit. And if you you've talked to Benny, he he details. He's a, such a student of the game. He's on top of everything. I see him. You know, I I, I love I, you know I, I geek out too. Like if he's cutting video or something. Sometimes I'll go try to sit with him. Oh, and, I'm jealous if yeah. you get to sit in on those. Yeah, and so I you know, see some scouting reports of other guys and how they do that. And he is just he's such a hard worker, such a, a great guy. And all, all these guys that are, you know, you got to put in, to be a coach at this level, you got to put in a ton of time. You know, you got to work your way up, especially. Um, no, but he, he deserves a ton of credit. He's done a great job and continues to do a great job. And, and a lot of the biggest thing, too, is, is you got to deal with these guys. Um, when when to come down and, and get the good work in, when to lay off, you know, if you have a tough game, when to kind of just step back. And, you know, he's done a really good job of managing that, I think, over his career and learning how to do that. So that's uh, big props to Big Benny. Mace, I got to let you go, man. We're at like 35 minutes here. I, prom- I promise you that we only needed 20. I could go all um, day, buddy. This dude, I, I've enjoyed every second of it. And more importantly, I think our listeners are going to for sure awesome. as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. See, now, now we're at the point where not just the goalies sort of, oh, man, I got to go to Vancouver and deal with yeah. Woodley. Now the broadcaster's <laughs> got to deal with it, too. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for being such a good sport. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. So what do you, what do you think? Listeners, I'm talking to you right now. Spatial intelligence. Like, is that not cool? Like, goaltending meets NASA here? I just, and I'm, not, I'm talking about the space agency, not, not the... Uh, the island uh, city. Uh, let's. Uh, what are you looking at me for, Hutch? I'm not looking at you. I'm ignoring you. You. Uh, you oh, really? Yeah, um, I'm. I'm but, actually looking through the archives for those old Chris Mason photos we had from Winnipeg. Uh, not only because I thought he had the coolest gear ever, um, but they were just spectacular photos of him hanging by the crossbar and sort of swinging there. So I need to find those to put up with this uh, podcast this week. He uh, he was part of the return of the Winnipeg Jets, and maybe that's why his gear stands out. But his 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 jet setup was wonderful. Yeah, and one of the first guys to really get into customizing the setup with Brian's. I thought it was spectacular. Yeah, you know what? He was the first guy when when it was announced that Winnipeg was getting a team. He was the was the first guy I called because I was asked to do a story on it, and I had a list of guys that were a couple guys that were on that Atlanta team that were going. And Mace was one of the first guys I called to talk about how cool that experience would be uh, for for going there. And right away, he was on the idea of custom gear. So uh, him and Brian's were just a perfect fit, eh? just with that 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 custom look. And he kept it simple, like big bold logos, right? Stuff you could That's see the key. from the upper deck, right? Yeah, I liked it. And and the, that kind of mask artwork is coming back. It's 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 to trending bolder. in that direction to bolder and simpler. Yeah, it's maybe gone way maybe too you do far. Your, your yeah. It's way the intricacy the of it. Yeah, just made it blurry. Uh, so as the smartest person on the podcast, Hutch spatial intelligence. Your take. I don't know enough about how he meant it in that context, but I think it's an absolutely spectacular goaltending term. I think it's something. We're seeing come up with uh, with a lot of the vision training as well that we've been able to touch on over the last little while. And, and we're going to have an interview uh, with another vision person coming up shortly. Um, but really, it, it, it's not it's not a two dimensional game. So spatial intelligence, I think, refers to to understanding the three dimensional uh, game, understanding the number of objects that we're having to track at one time. I think it's uh, it's a perfect goaltending term. Yeah, and while while you're moving, so I I knew that you would understand it a lot more than the two of us. Well, so I can yeah, make something I, I, up I'm anyway. Just, I'm just happy. Like normally, when people talk about goaltending and intelligence in regard to myself, it's just more like space case, <laughs> space cadet, you know, things like that. <laughs> the intel- intelligence intelligence is rarely applied. Watch puck <laughs> fall down. Hope it hits you. <laughs> uh, what number did? Uh, did Chris Mason wear? Yeah, see, now we, you've started a trend here. So I had to look that up. He was 30 originally in Nashville, but every other stop along the way, Atlanta, Winnipeg, and then St. Louis, and then the rest of his career, from what I can see, he went to number 50. So probably a story there. And now, now we've got something else we got to dig up. Oh, I'm just adding to your workload. To-do list is getting long. It's like one of those <laughs> honey-do lists. Thanks, Darren. You're right.
Uh, you guys had a great conversation, touched on uh, not only uh, UC Soros, but uh, Pekka Rene. And I don't know Pekka as well as, as, as you do, Woody, but it does jump out at me now that, that he is so thoughtful and considerate and polite. And, and I'm not saying, comparing that to that other guys are, are jerks, but um, maybe I didn't notice it be, just because he was so easy to deal with in the grand scheme of things. And, and that's the way, the way it should be. Uh, but I'm looking forward to hearing your conversation with Pekka Rene in a little bit. Yeah. And we're, uh, we're, you know, um, we didn't quite get the full amount of time we were hoping to get, uh, in the, in the room this week. Uh, but I promise to follow up when they're back in town. So consider this coming up, uh, part, part one to two, so to speak. And like that, because it's Pekka, like, he he had other things that he where he had to be, but it had to be someone else reminding him and sort of cutting it short very politely and totally understandably because, you know, Pekka, he would never do it himself like he, he would just because he's just like I said, it's with Mace. It's he's just that good a dude, like just one of the sort of purest guys you ever get a chance to talk to in the league. Well, he's big. He's bad, but in a good way. And he's Pekka Rene. We'll get to uh, him in just a little bit. But the gear segment presented by Source for Sports, Surrey, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com, dealing with one of those cool little products that, uh, that doesn't come from a massive manufacturer. And it's designed to just protect you and then uh, help you rehabilitate. There's a couple of different ways you can look at this product. It's called Goalie Block. It goes on your stick. And we are going to uh, let you listen to Cam and Woody and then offer our thoughts and uh, our tweaks or suggestions on, on how to use this product coming out of it. But first, let's go to Source for Sports Surrey, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com. Welcome back to the hockey shop, Source for Sports here in Surrey. We're in the basement, or as I always call it, goalie heaven with Cam Matwiv back after a week. We let CCM run the show last week with what, what I thought was a really fascinating segment on composite sticks and the evolution of composite sticks with Adam Gans. This week, we're back in the store with Cam, Hockey Shop Source of Sports and thehockeyshop.com to talk about a new product. How long you stocked it, actually? This is, this is the goalie block. And some of you may have seen it online on social media, maybe even in a, in a photo of a practice with an NHL goaltender. It's basically a piece of rubber that is sort of wraps around your stick to protect the index finger on the blocker. How long have you been stalking this goalie block cam mat with? So we're just a little bit over uh, two months here now. Um, we've seen um, some good good sales from it and some uh, good general interest. A lot of customers picking it up and you know asking questions about it, which is fantastic because we always start that conversation with it. Um, for those who don't know, basically, again, it's a rubber sleeve that slides onto uh, the paddle of your stick. And it's designed to give you that extra layer of protection from those pucks that will ride up. So a one in a million chance in the video that's up on their website on goalieblock.com, I believe it is. Um, basically, you see the video of the puck flying right up the paddle of the, the stick and hitting right off the block. And it's actually a nice slow motion video of it. It looks like it's a, a great shot. Um, but that's exactly what it's designed for. I don't know if it's one in a million. I got to be honest with you. We, we saw this as early in the summer. We're at net 360. Um, with you know a bunch of NHL goalies, not all of them put it on, but but most of them tried it there at least once. Not all of them kept it, but I mean, Rhymes had it on for a bit. Uh, Troy Grosnick, first time he had it on with me doing video, like sure enough, right away he got one that sort of rode up underneath the paddle, and you could tell uh, by his reaction and then talking to him to after that. Yeah, if that wasn't there, I would have felt it. I didn't necessarily break a finger, but he would have felt it. Um, and so I guess that's probably where it's more for is practice as opposed to games where you're seeing hundreds of shots instead of maybe 25 or 30 and just sort of an insurance policy, you know, against the potential for injury, something that doesn't seem to negatively affect the game in any way. So why not have that little extra bit of protection underneath your index finger? Exactly. For those listeners that have had the puck hit their finger, you know, no fun. Yeah. Or, you know, explode their finger as you've seen on some of those horror posts and whatnot. This is exactly the product for you. And this is, uh, this is totally why it came out. Or if you're, again, preemptively, you know, looking for the best protection possible, exactly what it's for. And what's some of the feedback you've had from customers early? So far, easy to install. Um, you know, once it's on there, it's kind of one of those products that's designed to stay on. Yeah. That's the one thing we've had, like easy to get on. But if you're, 
if you need to take it off, like you're like if you think you have two sticks, you want to go back and forth between the two, maybe a practice stick and a game stick. I, you know, it retails at thirty dollars. I, I think the best thing I could say is buy two because Definitely. getting it off and then swapping it to the other stick is a it's a little harder than just getting it on for the first time. That's some of the feedback we've had. It, it, exactly, exactly. That that would make the most sense uh, at that point. Or you have your you know game stick and your your practice stick, for example, and it stays on your practice stick as your extra protection. Yeah, and we and the, I would say that's where we've seen it used most in the NHL um, in a practice situation. A couple of guys, uh, Thatcher Demko had it on for one practice. They kind of, you know, I, I kind of equate it to players being told to maybe put on like a shot, a blocker. shot blocker, exactly, and maybe they don't love it, but hey, it's it sort of mitigates the risk. He was told to have it in practice, and he wasn't. He he didn't notice it that, but but he. He kind of felt like just, hey, be a goalie. Just go, that's part of being a goalie is feeling the odd one. But hey, if it could save you from a broken finger or not, I, th- I think it's a step worth taking. Sergei Bobrovsky uh, is using it. There's a guy who holds it really low on the paddle of his stick. We've talked about how his his custom CCM E-Flex 4 paddle is quite narrowed at the top and he holds it almost like the whole fist grip, probably like six inches down from where the paddle meets the shaft. And so you know, more likely holding it that low to have one right up. And so he's got the goalie block on there in all his practices. Talk to him about using it in a game. And he's just, you know, I can't, can't ever see himself using it in a game. But for practices, again, injury mitigation, uh, it makes sense. I have a kind of funny story. He, uh, he left an autograph stick for his old goalie coach now with the Vancouver Canucks, uh, Ian Clark. And I couldn't help but notice that he added him the sign stick and the goalie block was still on there. So when I talk about it being hard to take off, obviously not worth the effort to to save it it's it's now part of that autograph stick that that was given away it is legal in the nhl i talked to k whitmore a couple of weeks ago and it has been approved for you so if you wanted to roll with it into a game they don't feel like it's adding enough sort of stopping power um to be an issue it's not and an, you know it's it's for protection only and the nhl yeah. agreed with that and legalized it but so far pretty much you know just a practice piece i guess the one other piece of feedback we've had is and again, I don't know why you'd care, but um, it does seem to leave a discoloration band on it if you've had it on the stick for long enough. And you know, maybe if you are one of those guys that wants to go back and forth and use the stick in practice in games and don't want it on in games, you're going to have a little discoloration there over time. And hey, we are creatures of aesthetics as goaltenders, and not everybody will appreciate having that that little band um, left behind on their $250 composite. But other than that, it's, it's been all pretty positive feedback to be honest with you. Kind of feels like a no brainer in some ways from a protection standpoint. Um, then again, so does a dangler and I don't wear one of those. (laughs) Neither do I, neither do I for the record, but not the smartest, not the sharpest knives in the drawer over here, but it does make a lot of sense. Again, just injury mitigation and kind of frankly, I'm, I'm like, geez, how do we not think of this before? Yeah, yeah, it is one of those ones, but that's where, you know, uh, I guess breeds innovation is anytime you get yourself hurt or a finger broken or anything like that. So let's be honest, most fingers are broken when you do the stupid turn the paddle over and reach back and expose the bottom of your hand. Blocker protection these days is pretty good. But again, every once in a while, you're going to feel one that rides up the paddle and this will take that away. Exactly. And you know where you can get yours. At the Hockey Shop Source for Sports here in Surrey, British Columbia or at thehockeyshop.com. Cam, they retail for $29.99. You can find them on the website, again, thehockeyshop.com. It's the goalie block. We'll put some links up on our social media. Make sure you check out uh, the Hockey Shop social media on Instagram, uh, THS Goal on Instagram and on Twitter. And like I said, you can always find them at thehockeyshop.com. If they've got any questions about ordering, Cam, where do they get you? Uh, 604-589-8299. I think we're going to have to like overdub between you doing the number and Hutch doing like the email that people send, like when they go into their radio voices, and we're gonna have to have a little competition. You're, you're getting better, but I think. <laughs> okay, guys, you're on. Here we go. That's podcast at ingolmag.com. I think dad still has you on this one. Cam, thanks for your time. Thanks, as always, for uh, inviting us down to goalie heaven here in the lower floor of the hockey shop source for sports. We always enjoy it, and we'll catch up in a couple weeks. Thanks, Kim. Nice job. I like these products that that you guys unearth, or the hockey shop uh, source for sports, uh, Surrey, unearths. These these small, little, unique uh, products that uh, that goalie geeks can can really 
uh, dive into. And it's a credit to Cam and the staff at the hockey shop, right? We've talked about it on a weekly basis. You go there in part to see all the latest and greatest, the newest stuff. You know, that they got the new Brian's Optic 2 pads all in stock and, and a good, they've been on the ice in them. Cam can tell you how they feel, how they play, um, what it's like to wear them. He's a goalie. He's been there. He's done that. You can go find all the latest and greatest at the hockey shop, but also they got this rack on the side for accessories. And whether it's batting gloves with padded fingers and palms to wear under your glove, we talked about the lizard skins or the goalie block. As soon as the goalie block sort of started to make the rounds on goalie internet in the summer, Cam was all over it, made sure they stocked it. So if you've heard of it and you wondered where to get it, thehockeyshop.com is the place to go. Thehockeyshop.com and the Hockey Shop Source for Sports in Surrey is always the place to go, whether it's for the, the newest, the latest, the greatest from the biggest brands and the biggest manufacturers, or for little unique items like this. That's why I shop at the Hockey Shop Source for Sports, because they're a bunch of goalies. They know how much we geek on equipment, and they're always looking out to find the latest piece you can add to your bag to make you better, and in this case, a little bit safer. So kudos to Cam and the boys at the Hockey Shop for being on top of trends like this. Uh, make sure you check out their accessories page at the website at thehockeyshop.com for see what kind of little tools you can add to your bag. Hockeyshop.com, the accessories page, that's the first place I go to uh, on a weekly basis just to check out what's new, what's, uh, what's happening. And I am that person. So goalie block, uh, let's uh, just uh, concern and then uh, how you might uh, get around that. Uh, what what people might see as uh, something that's uh, not uh, just a little bit of a negative to the product because it does does affect your stick uh, and the coloration of it. Hutch. Yeah, we uh, we first got some experience with the goalie block this summer at uh, one of Eli Wilson's camps. Uh, Maddie was in a training group with uh, Joel Hofer, of the Portland Winterhawks, who uh, I think skates in the summers with the, uh, the inventor of the product. Um, I apologize. I forget his name. Um, and so Joel gave one to Maddie to, to use. And um, my, my first thoughts on it are, are words that Kevin used in the interview, which was uh, it's a no brainer. I, I, I get some of the, I just be a goalie and don't use it, but, but come on, it's uh, it doesn't really add any weight to your stick, uh, anything significant anyway. It's at a place where it doesn't create any balance issues and it creates protection. So why wouldn't you use it? Um, the only little drawback we noticed uh, that I did send on to the manufacturer when we were using it is uh, there is some discoloration that was brought up in the interview. But I just just want to be clear that everybody is aware of that because um, that discoloration tends to bleed down the stick over time. And, uh, and at this point, the stick that had it on, it's, it's almost double the width of, of the actual product. So if you're really finicky about how your, your stick looks, I would just suggest you do something like um, put some tape underneath the goalie block before you, before you put it on there so that any bleeding that happens doesn't, doesn't affect the stick, although we haven't tested that, but it, it would make sense to me that that would work. Um, but it was significant enough that even another stick that was leaning against it in the stick rack was getting a bit of discoloration as well. So uh, it would be great if they could tidy that one little piece up, but I also don't think it's a tough thing for for us to deal with as a goaltender uh, for a product that I, I really do think should be part of our stick as much as a, as a dangler should be, Kevin. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. You talk like it, it really, I think, is a product for the most part that's designed to be left on, right? Like it's it's not a you're probably not swapping it from one stick to another, no, you know, on, on a game not. game to game basis. So, and then that brings the question. You know, if you want it on your quote unquote practice stick, if you're lucky, you have one of those that you just use in practice. Like I don't, me, I use an old stick for warm ups, and then switch to a game stick when the game starts. Because come on, well, I like come I, on a warm up uh, stick in beer league. It's just an old stick. It's just an old stick because I have teammates that tend to do things <laughs> like no, 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 no. This this conversation is not even worth going down. Kevin's it's probably so got a first bizarre. and second period sticks as well. Yeah, it's not my fault that you guys don't play with teammates who are good enough to snap your shaft with one shot. Why would oh I bring, God. why would I bring this, a brand new stick out we've actually hit the stage where and Woody's risk using the, having my, you didn't stick, play the game, <laughs> have my, have my stick broken by my idiot teammates. I'm going to want that to be an old stick rather than the one I want to use in the game. So there you go. That's my point. Bite me. Both of you. One of the worst things an athlete can say to me is you didn't play the game and you just used it on me. <laughs> no, no. I just said my beer league team, which sucks, is better than your beer league team. 
Um, so I, I'm guessing anyway, Darren so, skated with a few better players than either one of us have in some of those NHL skates. Hey, eh, Darren. Yeah, but, yeah, but Darren works for a team now. He's getting sticks from like he's getting player sticks and trying them out and taking like like NHL goalie sticks out there. He doesn't have to worry about breaking his stick. He's the only guy who's got more gear Just than us. Dip into Flowers reserves anytime he needs them now. Uh, yeah. Um, so pucks it, don't hit me, so they they come out brand new. They don't hit yeah. me either. They just hit the shaft of the stick and break it. Um, so, anyways, back to the point. Uh, you know, it's funny to see Bobrovsky actually hand off an autographed stick as a keepsake to someone, and he left the goalie block on it. So oh, that tell yeah. that tells you how you know, like if it's on there, it's on there, and that's kind of that's kind of the way it goes. Um, interesting, Henrik Lundqvist. Uh, we're talking about the goalie block, but Henrik Lundqvist was recently spotted at the outdoor practice in um, Central Park with the Rangers. Had a paddle wedge, which is sort of a competitive product to the goalie block. It's another new one. And he was using that in practice. So clearly, uh, this is something that goalies are starting to use. And before we go any further, Guy St. Vincent from St. Anne, Manitoba, middle province, my province, uh, is uh, the goalie block inventor. So congratulations. We love uh, innovators. We love people thinking uh, outside the box to, uh, to try and make this game better and more protective and safer and uh, and also keeps us thinking. Uh, entrepreneurs are awesome and uh, we uh, we encourage everybody to send us send us your idea, especially the uh, the Curtis curve. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. To one. Darren Millard yeah. at uh, what's the new address in Vegas, Darren? Uh 555 555 five, yeah. five, <laughs> 1212. Five, five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go go ahead, Woody. I'm just going to leave that there. Uh, you, I thought you were going to jump in about uh, innovation and entrepreneurs uh, <laughs> before I went down the, the Curtis Curve route. Uh, so we, we talked to Mace. I'm going to call him Mace because uh, everybody uh, this has the last name Mason is, uh, is Mace. We talked to Mace. We talked, to, uh, talked about the goalie block. And now Pekka Rene. And how do, you, how do you guys say his last name? Just Rene. Okay, good. The, uh, he, w- he burst on the scene. And when he, when he came in... Uh, like he's part of that, a really strong goalie factory in Nashville. When you go back through the years, like there's some, they've never been without a, a great number one goaltender or prospect, but he, he became the face of the franchise for a seventh round pick is pretty incredible. Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it true that he was actually found by their scouts when he was a backup and they only saw him in warm up for the first time? Well, I mean, they, the scouts had obviously seen him play, but when they brought um, more people over to watch him, and uh, I, I apologize, I can't remember the exact story, whether that was you know a different layer of scout or whether it was actually one of their goalie people or even a Mitch Korn, um, although I doubt it would be Mitch heading over to Finland. But when they brought sort of a second set of eyes to have a look, they got there and Pekka wasn't playing. So they basically all they got to do was watch him in the warm up half an hour before the game. And, you know, that was, uh, enough. that was enough. And if you take a look at that draft class that year, I think there was four or five guys picked in the first round. Uh, Al Montoya going early, Corey Schneider later in the first round. And there's Pekka. And like you said, they're in 258th overall. And, you know, now, like you, as you said earlier, Hall of Fame, future Hall of Famer, iconic goaltender for the Nashville Predators like he really is the face of that franchise and deservedly so that's remarkable that you say he's the same draft year as Schneider because it just feels like he's been around for twice as long I I absolutely agree yeah well one one guy got stuck behind Roberto Luongo and Martin Brodeur at a couple of his stops and the other didn't yeah what what North America and uh, and all and we knew we've known Schneider for so long uh, for before he even became a prof- professional, but I'm I'm with you on that. That's a great pickup, uh, Hutch, on on how much you think of Schneider and and Pekka Rene. Yeah, and Pekka, we didn't mention tallest goaltender to ever win the Vesna Trophy. As everybody's looking for tall goaltenders, he's the only one I think over six foot four to win it, and by a long shot, right? Uh, I think he's. I think Peck's list sets. He might even be listed just at six five, but. Um... By a long <laughs> shot in terms there, of right? six yeah. foot six foot four being like the gap between the last guy to win it at six four, wasn't it Dryden? And then the next guy was Pekka. Like that's how big the gap is in an era where we're all chasing monstrous goaltenders or a lot of NHL teams are. 
Although we've talked about that before, that's shifting as well. We have more teams finally recognizing that your ideal window is 6264, and anything below or above size is something you have to overcome. So, but that's a topic for another day. Yeah, it goes into our, our summertime conversation that we just got uh, goofing around on that that day that we were hot stove in it uh, with with Eli Wilson and and one of the other ones was release and whether or not you could actually see a release and hearing you and and Mace Woody talk about release which is there's so much as as far as we've come there's still so much that that is still debatable about about playing the position one thing that isn't is the impact that Pekka Rene has had on the position both with his size his demeanor and his skill set here is the Nashville Predator goaltender with Kevin Woodley on In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by Source for Sports Surrey, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com. I want to go back to where it started for you. Like, where did the passion for goaltending, you remember the first time you were in net? Like, how did this all start for Pekka in it? It was because of my cousin, um, my cousin Yari. He's seven years older than me, and uh, he was a goalie back in uh, Kempele, Finland, which is uh, close to my hometown, Oulu. Um, that's where I was born. And um, yeah, he was a goalie. I always looked up to him, and I, I thought that was the like, coolest thing, you know, all the gear and, you know, the mask. And even though he didn't, he didn't wear a mask, he had the old uh, pocket and, and cage, old school uh, system, but... Uh, yeah, so it started as a, you know, being a street hockey goalie and I, I would always, so obviously they were older than me and they were taking shots on me and, and I just fell in, fell in love with the position and, um, I didn't start playing hockey in a team until I was uh, seven years old. So my cousin took me to the first practice. It was, um, on the outdoor, outdoor rink and, uh, I was a, I was a player, you know, I, I skated out. Uh, first practice and we didn't have a regular goalie so I, I asked right away I'm like you know listen I uh, I want to be a goalie and and uh, since that day uh, I've been a goalie seven eight at what point in that evolution from young kid just loving the position to thinking maybe there was a future in it like it like at what point did it get serious for you when did it go from fun to I guess maybe it's still fun but when, when did it sort of cross that line to something you thought you could do for a long time uh for me it was uh later on it was um I, I was never like a high high prospect anything like that and I never played single one national team game for juniors or junior team or anything like that so um uh it was it was probably when I was 17 something like that 17 18 uh, started playing with my my hometown junior team. That it's a that's a really good team, and um, it's Carpat, right? Yeah, exactly, Carpat. And uh, so started over there and played through the uh, the junior system last last three years, I think, the last two years. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's it was a it was a big big time wake up call for me. I um, I wasn't you know up to fitness to play in that level. I wasn't you know like the summer training. It was a shock to me. I was absolute um the first summer with them I you know because before that I I played different sports I I played um you know Finnish baseball and and all this stuff um during the summers and I I, w I would just play hockey in the in the you know during the season and 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 then other sports during the summer you know I, I obviously I I still think that I, I was lucky because I got to do that I it was uh, beneficial for me but I was just gonna ask because we hear a lot about maybe goalies now from eight years old that's all they do is yeah. you see the benefit payoff we've obviously talked about Pesapola in the past and the glove hand you, you think that physical literacy of playing all those other sports benefited you as a pro well I I, I think so I you know I I've been physically and and hockey wise too I, I've always been a late bloomer so I, I think it was beneficial for me. Maybe, maybe not, not to everybody, but I, I thought that I was lucky that I got to do that. Um, I got to kind of come up through the ranks at my own speed. You know, I, nobody was really pushing me or it wasn't until I, I figured everything out, you know, what I wanted to do and what I was willing to put into it yeah, and true. willing to sacrifice. And, and um, you know, it was, a, it was a big, like I, like I said, it was a big time wake up goal for me. Um, and then I started putting in the work. I got really passionate. Hockey was always my passion, but I, I really started enjoying the process and enjoying, uh, you know, kind of challenging, challenging my, myself. And it was, uh, it was obviously 
a good challenge for me because you know I would I would compare myself to to the other team other guys um, on my team and other goalies and things like that and I knew that I you know there's ways to go and but that's that's when it really you know started getting more serious it was still fun but you know more serious to me I think you had Nicholas Backstrom as a playing partner in Carpat 0405 what role did he play in that that sort of that stage of your development as an influence well I, you know he was uh, he was coming to his prime priming in his career and uh, at the time and just a great guy great partner um you know I, I think i learned a lot from him um he he always had like the hardest work ethic and i would always uh try to match that and and uh at you know at the time he was I, in my opinion he was one of the better goalies outside of nhl so i i think he was a great mentor for myself and so yeah for sure he had a he had an impact and then um our goalie coach, uh, Ari Hilly. I still to this day work with him, you know, over the summer. So he, he's had obviously a big time impact in my career. And you come over here, you're drafted, you come over Nashville in the organization in Milwaukee at the beginning. I mean, well, we all know Mitch was a part of the development yeah. at the beginning. What was that? Your, what do you look back on that experience and working with him? What are your memories? First, first, first experience with him. It can be a little sh- shocking. I think maybe for some guys, the first time he's, yeah. he's blunt. Oh yeah, he's uh, he's straight up. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. I mean, I thought that I was, you know, I was so I was when I came over. I, I wasn't, I wasn't extremely young. I was, I was just turning uh, twenty three that season, and uh, but I was very naive. I, you know, first time outside of Finland, really, and and uh, you know, everything was new, and I was super excited about everything, and and. But yeah, Mitz was Mitz was awesome. Uh, but he, yeah, he he tells you if he if he sees something and he lets you know if if he thinks that it, you know there's 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 area that you gotta work on or. But I, I loved it because you know obviously he he saw something in me in me and I felt that right away and you know so then it's easier to take that that you, you take it the right way and uh, but he he was always so good to me and. I mean, he's a, he's a legend in, in, in his, in his business in, in his line of work. So, um, you know, all the goalies he's, he's had, and he's been able to work with guys, you know, with different, different style of play too. you know, hockey has changed over the years in his career, um, massive amount. So it was, it was great. He, he had, he had a big impact. Do you remember what changed and maybe more importantly, what didn't, because there's probably times as a big goalie young in your career where other people would have said, Oh, he, needs to do this or needs to do that and I know Mitch wanted to encourage that the athleticism never left your game is, is that as important as what changed what he didn't try and force to change yeah he never I I can't think of anything he really tried to change um you know I was very raw at the time I I always played very athletic style of um hockey and I would challenge guys I would come out far and um uh, I would use my use my hands a lot and you know things like that and uh, I think I think he started the process of trying to slow my game down a little bit, um, trying to become more patient, trying to you know trust my trust my size a little bit better and things like that. And um, but he he never he never took anything away from my game. I you know obviously he added a lot of things, but he never he never really tried to change me. How's it how's it continue with Benny? How's that relationship? How's that process? Because you still always look for things. You've never rested on your laurels. I think it's one of the things I've always admired about you. Uh he's he's awesome. I, I think uh, you know, obviously Benny is only I, I think he's only a year older than me, so we are very very much the same same age level and um but he's been awesome. He's so he's so passionate about being a goalie. Uh, be you know, being in a goalie business and um, just finds a way to, you know, get, you know, new things and uh, everything like that. So, so he's, he's been, he's been awesome for me and Juice. Just, he's so polite, so cool. And I can't wait because there is going to be a second part of this conversation with Pekka Rene in 2020, which isn't that far away. Woody, what's the uh, you, you've got it set up? Everything's ready to go and rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, they're back in town in February. I just and like I said before, like uh, no fault of anyone. It's just uh, the window was tight and he had to get going. And um, yeah, Pekka probably would have sat there and talked forever if somebody didn't remind him he had to be somewhere else. So 
Uh, we cut it short, which is a little too bad because it felt like we were just kind of going through that history. And I enjoyed hearing him talk about how late it was before he started to really take it seriously. Uh, I think a guy who is praised for his glove hand, like maybe one of the best gloves in the NHL, um, you know, talking about how he played different sports, including baseball, Pesapola, Pesapola. Uh, and how that, yeah, how that played into that active glove and sort of physical literacy and the dynamic nature of his game. Um, I love that part of the conversation, but we were just starting to get into, you know, the evolution as it continues um, today with Ben Vanderklok and and the way he's still trying to quiet down his game and the impact that UC Soros has had um, on him recognizing the importance of it. Um, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to part two because I felt like we were just starting to get into some of the fun stuff. So that just means we we get to uh, we get to have some. Yeah, have some fun later. I think, Kevin, just while we're talking about it, because it's something we mentioned earlier we wanted to talk about. I think you've told that Pesapola story uh, way back when we had the In Gold Digital Magazine, those uh, old PDF flip books. Um, and uh, I think we've got something to talk about along those lines, too, don't we, Kev? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's a nice reminder. Good segue, Hutch. Um, somebody's awake. The rest of us are... Some of us have spatial awareness. Some of us are just space cadets, and that would be me. December 1st, boys. Um, nothing like waiting until an hour plus into the podcast to tell everyone we've got an awesome new product coming uh, at ingolmag.com. It will be a subscription product. Keep an eye out for it. Uh, we're going to start to... We've been banking drills, gear tips, gear segments and something we call pro reads with NHL goaltenders over the past couple of summers, this summer, and into the season this year. And we are going to unveil some exclusive material that goalies are going to absolutely eat up at ingoalmag.com, launching on December 1st. Have a little bit of a magazine feel in terms of the homepage that links you to all the different the articles you're going to be able to subscribe to. Some weekly features on gear. And the one I'm most excited about, and we'll get Pekka, to do one of these in February when he comes back through time, uh, through town, we already kind of talked about it, um, is that pro read segment. So everybody on the internet loves to watch goals and plays and tell you what the goalie shouldn't have done or where he made a mistake or sometimes highlight high real, highlight real saves. Uh, we decided we'd like to have the goalies do it. So essentially what pro reads will be will be a weekly goalie segment with NHL goaltenders walking you through what they see on the ice, the reads they make, and why they play a certain situation a certain way. I can tell you that the insights you get from these guys are incredible. The level of detail that goes into their reads is, I mean, Carey Price blew us away the first one he went through. Eh, Hodge? Like just the amount of information he's picking up away from the puck before he makes a read. And... and the- and, and what he's doing in response. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's, why uh, he's dropping a leg versus one or, you know, why he's butterflying versus just one. Like, it's it's incredible. And I think kids, old, well, no matter what, if you're a goalie, that insight laid over video of him walking, it's going to be like, it's going to be like being in the room when he goes over a segment with his goalie coach and we're going to bring you inside that room. Yeah, and just to be clear, that's, that's a massive highlight of what we're producing, but... Um, we haven't actually named it in my mind. I'm, it's sort of like in goal premium or something along those lines where our members can come inside the room with us. And that's a massive highlight, but it, it's not the only piece. It's just one, one small piece of, uh, of this premium edition of in goal magazine that we're going to start bringing you um, December 1st. Darren, probably a bit of a surprise to you too. We haven't even been chatting about this much. You were actually, Are you in? Up, uh, we, we've talked a lot about uh, yeah, content concept. Uh, during our, our discussions. But one thing that uh, that I've always wondered is there, there's different things that, that you guys have collected. And I thought, I wonder where that, that is. I wonder where that's going. And it <laughs> it's goes in the into vault this, waiting for the day yeah, this, this happens. Tickle yeah. trunk of goaltending uh, information. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, why don't, instead of naming it premium, why don't we name like the basic level uh, Millard, the medium level Woody, <laughs> and then the premium level Hutch. Because Dad, you, yeah. you are our, our premium Just for guy. goalie dads. <laughs> yeah. 
I think I think there's 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 something there, but there's uh, that that's fascinating to to hear somebody talk you through a, a play selection or a save selection like that. Yeah, and it's usually you know it's funny um, as as a goalie coach once said to me when you're when you're rewinding, especially when they're looking at goals, it's not usually the shot; it's the three or four touches before a shot and the reads and the movements of the goaltenders that actually cause a goal where they can get behind on a play, where they make a misread, where they end up chasing. And so, you know, the level of reads as a play moves around a zone or as an odd man rush comes into the zone, again, the the amount of detail these guys dissect on the fly and then their ability to sort of relay it months later when we're looking back over video has been fascinating. I'm looking forward to adding some of the guys coming through town now um, with more recent plays. So they're looking at plays that happened last week and we'll bring them to you the following week with a video overlay of, of them talking about it. And not just, not just months later, but, but years later, I mean, I remember one of them, you showed Kerry and he just said, Whoa, we're getting old school here. And it was one from many years ago, but, but he could recall what had happened there. Like he was on the ice doing it yesterday. And it doesn't have to be crazy, uh, saves or or uh, experiences but like a three on two and watching uh, listening to Carey Price or Pekka Rene describe okay what goes into uh, how he does a setup if it's a left-handed shot coming down the right side and and the uh it's a traditional three on two uh, what what's my thought process here and just because I I couldn't tell you what my thought process would be or maybe you guys could but it like where 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 the impact of a left shot compared to a right shot uh, impact. My pro, my thought process usually just don't fall down. Yeah, <laughs> mine would be wh- take away the middle and then and then uh, and then go hey, from I, there. I just love two things. Full credit to Woody on this. When we started doing gear reviews way back in the day, uh, he wanted to frame that they were a positive thing. Um, that we're talking about who the gear is for, whose game it fits best. Uh, and then when we started to talk about these pro reads, fully his idea, um, it was all about being positive as well. You look on the internet too much. The culture is just taking other people down. What went wrong here? What went wrong there? What should this guy have done? Yeah. And whereas this is, what did he do right? And let's really focus on the positive here. And I just love that. Would he being positive? No. He uses it all up in these and he's got nothing left for the rest of us. Yeah. I wow. save my negativity for the, for, for my TSN radio hits. That's why I just I just carve and chop everyone, <laughs> including you guys when you're not listening. I was listening this morning. Oh no, we we got a taste of that early on. You don't play with as good of players <laughs> as I do, you guys. Uh, this has been a, a ton of fun. It's kind of cool getting uh, a former goaltender uh, who's still involved in the game in Chris Mason and a current goaltender who's uh, in the tail end of his career, but still very much impactful and. I, the the idea that you guys talked about uh, finish baseball uh, is is really uh, enjoyable because he uses his glove to catch pucks right on the ice. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he goes about that, but it's uh, the influence is is significant, and I'm glad that you guys touched on it. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's funny. That's a story that I remember writing that story for the first time way back the first time the Nashville Predators made the playoffs. And the impact of Pekka's glove. And yeah, I mean, we could all see how active it was. He would catch pucks even on the blocker side. And it wasn't orthodox. But the impact of him sort of scooping pucks in front of his pads on low shots and talking to Shea Weber at the time about, you know, as a defenseman, a rebound, you've got your back to that rebound. You're facing the player. Puck goes off a pad. You got to then find it and sort of recalibrate defensively. And just the amount of, how much easier their life was because Pekka would just scoop those pucks four or five times a ga- day or a game. And those were four or five less pucks and rebounds that they had to chase as defensemen. And just how much easier it was them for take a whistle, reset off the face off and play that out of their own end versus, okay, the pucks off the pad. Now I got to find it. And we got to reset and chase everyone defensively. Like the impact of his act of glove um, goes way beyond flashy glove saves. It has a serious impact on the Predators and their ability to defend and the way they play. And as Mason talked to you, like I love Peck's always looking for innovations or ways to, you know, get better. He struggled in low event games when the Predators became a defensive team. He, he struggled as an active goalie to feel good about his game when he wasn't busy. So what did he do? He went out and worked his ass off to become a better puck handler 
and he's got a take no prisoners attitude to tracking pucks down behind the net. Sometimes a little You're too right aggressively, that. like he yeah. will like he will go like butterfly slide or like a one knee down VH into the boards to stop a hard rim because again. Maybe not everyone would recommend it, especially if that puck's off the glass. He'll go back there and catch it on a high rim. Um, but that's his way of engaging and staying in the game and staying active when he's not as busy. And what gets lost is, yes, that's kind of flashy and what a lot of people talk about. But after he corrals those pucks, the amount of work he put into becoming a better puck handler to help his defenseman after he's got that thing corralled and needs to make a play and needs to make a decision on where to move it like that's those are all just things that he did to continuously get better. And he's he's a guy who's got a Vesna trophy. He's a guy who probably could have rested on his laurels a long time ago, but he never does. And isn't it all isn't it amazing how many how often we're talking about those types of guys and the ones that have long careers, the ones that never are satisfied with the status quo. Getting to the the idea of what's coming up with goalie reads, can you find information on in goal uh magazine dot com right nope, now? But you will be able to soon. End of the week, we'll have something okay. up. And uh, when this uh, next newsletter goes out to share the news about the podcast, we'll, we'll have something up about the new edition as well. Perfect. I just don't want anybody going there and getting a 404. <laughs> a little conversation we had. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Woody has no idea what we're talking about, but that's okay. Now I know how you guys feel most of the time. <laughs> oh, 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 good one. Oh. And with that, we will end it. Uh, this is why. Folks, goalie tandems are great, but when you add that third goaltender, it just leads to disruption <laughs> and uh, and feuding because that's what we've got now. <laughs> it's disruption and feuding. Uh, thanks to Chris Mason. Thanks to uh, Pekka Rene. And uh, thanks to Cam at The Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com and Source for Sports Surrey. On behalf of David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley, no fancy out cue or uh, saying goodbye this time around. We're just going to cancel it while we're all friends. We look forward to talking to you again next week on In Goal Radio, the podcast. Stay good. Stay good.